five, four, three. Hello, hello. This is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining us. I am here with a couple of dudes, Mr. Tatro, who just gave us a presentation on our YouTube channel for MixCon 2021. He went through the finishing touches of a mix uh, for us, and uh, he really used nothing but the stuff built into BandLab. In case you're not familiar with it, BandLab is a totally free DAW, runs out of your browser, you can run out of Chrome, and it will also run on your smartphone. And Tatra was doing some cool stuff going back and forth between his um, smartphone and his uh, laptop. We've also got a guy here from BandLab, Mr. John Ivers. John, thanks for joining us as well. Thank you for having me. Great. And Tatro, thank you for that presentation. It was awesome, really detailed. Uh, I was excited to make it. Thanks for having me here. Good stuff, man. Now, you actually did some sample generation. I just want to ask a few questions of my own before we get totally. into questions from the audience. We already have some questions coming in from the audience. You guys feel free to just type right into the live chat right here on screen your questions, and we'll get to them as they come in real time. So if you have any questions about Band Lab, about Tatro's process, any of that, totally cool. Just uh, shoot them out there. But I want to ask you about uh, sound generation for this particular mix. We were talking about the mixing side of things. We are going in, doing your final touches, doing your last little bit of uh, sweetening. But I'm curious about where most of the sounds came from. So you did create a new set of samples, uh, or you showed off how to do it on your phone. For this particular mix, are you grabbing from loop libraries? Are you doing a lot of found sound? Because I know something you like to do a lot. Uh, what went into the initial creation and generation of this track? Yeah, so the sounds that I showed off like using with the sampler, those are all like sounds that I collected. So there's a few like key percussion elements that are all found sound. Um, and then everything else in the track is made right within BandLab from BandLab's library. So with the sampler, you know, I like the combination of using like sort of some pre-made musical ideas, but then also MIDI instruments. And then with the sampler, what I am able to do is take some pre-existing loops and chop them up and make them my own. So like the backbone of the track is this uh, cool, you know, chord loop that's chopped up in sampler that I might not have otherwise used if I didn't have the ability to chop it. But being able to chop it with the sampler I can put my own spin on it and then layer on a bunch of instruments on top. Um, there's a chopped vocal sample in there using sampler. So since using, since the implementation of the sampler, actually, um, it fits a lot better into my workflow. So everything, every sound that you hear, besides the sounds that I showed that were collected as like found sounds are all from within Band Labs library. Right. Cool stuff. And a couple more questions for me just about Band Lab in general. And this would be for either of you, I guess. Um, and is it possible to run third-party plugins inside of Band Lab or because of the browser-based format, are you really always just using Band Lab tools? Yeah, so I, I can answer that. Um, there is some limitation um, to our ability to run native plugins like an AU or VST um, within the browser. It's just not possible um, for a lot of security reasons to uh, kind of sync something native uh, right. to something hooked up to the browser. Um, and there's a lot of performance issues. Um, that said, so everything that we make is, you know, works on both the browser and mobile, um, mm -hmm. which is sort of like the, you know, our stance on that. We'd rather, you know, if you can't work with everything because of some technical limitations, at least what we offer, um, you can work with everywhere. And we're trying to make it easier. I think our responsibility then is to, you know, take our tools and move to um, other tools then, right, um, from that. So long term, you know, that's kind of you know, it's one of the pathways we see um, moving forward. But yeah, right now it's really all in the box. Um, and that's the, how we get the cross platform uh, magic at this point. Right. Now it's cool that you have that stability from one side to the other. And there do seem to be an extensive assortment of plugins there to begin with. How often are you guys uh, releasing or updating new plugins? Because it seems like there's just uh, over the past five, six years, you guys have been around. There's been a ton developed already. Yeah, totally. So we, um, yeah, I have, I think, over 35 um, individual effects at this point and hundreds of presets, um, as well as um, models of instruments, uh, virtual analog models, and, you know, over 15,000 royalty-free sounds um, within BandLab. And that all just comes, you know, completely free uh, when you sign up for the application. Um, we release new loop packs every week, um, uh, about three right now, artist packs. Um, 
we release presets um, at a slower interval, but you know, our strategy there is that um, you know, we have a community of like really talented creators and rather than us like you know, building out all these presets or effects vocal chains, right? We think it would be much cooler for say Tetro to start doing that. And that's where you know, the generation of these uh, new sounds or assets or kits, right? Or effects presets, ultimately like we want it to be you know, community grown. So um, in essence, like we do release things at regular intervals, but, you know, weekly, long-term, we love it just to be the community, a self-sustaining, you know, community of uh, sound assets. Yeah. Now, speaking of community, there are some community features in there. There's a very sound cloud, for lack of a better term, so I bring up another company, but there's a very sound okay. cloud interface that people who might not be familiar with BandLab yet would feel as familiar, you know, as far as releasing the tracks, previewing the tracks. And one thing that you guys have that I thought was really interesting, I didn't know about until I saw Tatro's presentation, is you guys have the mastering filters built in right there. And Tatro went through a few of them. He ended up using the fire one, but there was the clarity, the tape, and they all sounded dramatically different from one another. Like you really did have kind of a, a palette of tonal colors there is all, all of that stuff is free too, right? Uh, the, the mastering side of it, is that stuff free as well? Yeah, that's correct. So the, um, for reference, I'm the you know, product lead for our creation tools. At I Band should Lab, have so introduced I, no, you no, okay. better. John Ivers of BandLab wasn't enough. Yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. Yes. The so I get to, product, the, yeah. Tell me the title again. A lead product manager. But basically what I do is I, you know, I, we have the creation team within BandLab, which is this assortment of tools to, you know, try and empower musicians to make music. So we have mastering, right? BandLab sounds, find any sound or sample you need and mix editor, which is, you know, the first cloud native way to collaborate in producing music. Um, and all of those, um, you know, the creation tools are free within the BandLab platform. Um, and so that's absolutely correct. You know, you sign up uh, for BandLab, you could, you know, unlimited mastering, unlimited downloads, share your track, um, you get unlimited storage. So we see a lot of people with mastering, you know, uploading tracks, sending it to friends for feedback, you know, cause you kind of, it's, it, it's a little bit in, you know, I always feel insecure sending an unfit. I always add a little bit of compression or mastering, mm -hmm. right? Even if I'm gonna share something in progress and, you know, for mastering it's about that speed. So we have all of our, you know, audio processing algorithms running in the browser so we can bring that um, you know, directly to mastering. It just takes, you know, a second to download. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. It's free. We worked with some really great master engineers like uh, Mandy Parnell, who worked with Brian Eno and Aphex Twin or Mike Tucci, who worked with Young Thug and uh, Maria Elisa Ayerbay, right, to yeah. make some of these presets. And um, it's just super exciting to be able to like, you know, anybody can access them to uh, sound better all for free. Right. Uh, amazing stuff. And this is one of my the pitches I'm going to give here. I didn't even realize this until now, but if someone didn't want a new free DAW that worked in their browser or in their phone, it's like, man, you could just go ahead and use it only for the mastering and the storage functionality, which pretty much any peer product is charging for at this point. Um, so, uh, I mean, if you go to land or SoundCloud, that kind of stuff, you're not going to get the same type of storage and mastering stuff at absolutely zero dollars. So uh, yeah, that's absolutely you true. Check it out. Even if you don't want to learn a new brow, uh, a new um, uh, DAW. Yeah. Right, and we do have um, a, just one, a band lab assistant actually, which allows you to access all of our sound content and mastering, mm -hmm. you know, from your desktop. So if you want to sync your projects, share stuff and your existing doll drag and drop loops from our library, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or drag and drop to master your track. You so this don't is like a drop boxy functionality where it's kind yeah, of built exactly. into your file, file yeah. architecture. Very cool. So a desktop app um, for exactly that use case, right? There's a lot of value for people who don't even want to learn another doll. Yes. I'm going to eventually, I'll save this for later, but I'm going to ask you eventually the tough question of how is all of this free and how could it possibly stay free? <laughs> sure. Forever? We'll get there eventually because other people are curious and doing my research on BandLab. It's a common question that comes up. So we'll, we'll get there, but I want to take some of the audience questions. Um, we've had a few people in here. Um, LA Winter has been asking uh, a lot of good questions. He seems to be a BandLab power user in there. And one of his questions is, uh, I'll turn to you first, Tatro. What are the most useful keyboard shortcuts in BandLab? Anything particular you found as far as shortcuts and stuff like that in BandLab for your workflow? I think uh, one of the things that I'm finding as, uh, you know, primary Ableton user, but then also jumping over to BandLab for projects like this is 
there's a lot of like industry standard kind of functionality being built into band lab. So it feels familiar, which is the best jumping off point that you can have, especially if you work between DAWs and things like that. So um, things like click, like holding options, clicking and dragging loops. I think also there's a little bit of the workflow built in, like say I want a four bar phrase to uh, continue repeating for eight or 16 bars or something, rather than having to duplicate that or copy it across, I can literally just drag it as a loop itself, drag the end of it. So there's like certain little smart workflow things like that and there's a lot of pretty much like industry standard like uh you know undo is my favorite keyboard shortcut i have to say for all the mistakes <laughs> yeah. that i make I, i'm the fastest at hitting a command z on a keyboard that's for sure yeah yeah command yeah, z I'll, and command yeah. s are probably the two most powerful functions in any daw period totally uh, i think anything so that, yeah <laughs> anything that you want to add to that john no i will yeah I, a few things tato's right we don't want to reinvent the wheel like everybody has a mm -hmm. mental model of how dolls work for pros that use Vanab, you know, it's about getting your idea out and like, you know, just exporting it using it somewhere else. Hotkeys on web, L, open the loop library. I'm always dragging and drop. You know, we do, like Tatra said, we will auto, we have some workflows we've already helped you with like auto looping or will, um, you know, auto stretch or, you know, match the key of a loop you drag into your project. So you don't need to worry about editing it. Um, and I think, yeah, the other one that I really like, and it's maybe more of a workflow on web than a hotkey, but the MIDI mappings tab, you open it, you click on a parameter, you move the parameter on your MIDI device, and all of a sudden you can record automation from a hardware device, you know, into your browser, and it's extremely fun. So you have that effect chain, you want to add the knob to the filter and the reverb space, and the distortion, and just jam. Um, it's, yeah, maybe not a hotkey, but just a workflow that... Um, makes me extremely happy and it's very quick. Nice. And how is BandLab working with things like uh, external controllers, whether it be for doing automation with physical controls or MIDI controllers and those kinds of things? It's great. I'll, I'll speak from experience as an artist, like, mm -hmm. and I'm all about MIDI controllers. Like that's kind of oh. like my thing. So um, plug it in, it works. You boot it up, immediately recognize. I mean, even, um, well, let me grab this. Uh, on mobile, you know, especially with the new sampler, like playing on a touch screen is fine, but I have this like little quick like controller, the Korg Nano Pad 2, and just like an iPhone connecting cable that boom, like as soon as I sample something, like I have this tactile like approach that I go to if I'm carrying this around. So you imagine like this plus an iPhone being like this amazing mobile setup, like mm. this like fits in a tiny bag. Nice. I can't add anything to it. It should be plug and play magic. Um, yes. So yep. Tetro, uh, yeah, an artist can speak better to it than, than me. It appears the, uh, there is no lie detected. All right. <laughs> uh, Charles Rashabad says, Tetro, I didn't realize a band, that BandLab did so many great things. Um, uh, use them a lot. And I'm not taking, I'm not taking the degree that you have. That's awesome. Tiana Jones says, dope video. Oya Music says, whoa, dope. There must be. A lot of dope saying in the lo-fi hip-hop community. Yes, a lot of things are dope. I I'll just say, like, one of the most dope things is, like, I think I talked about it a little in the video. It's, like, our creative process as musicians, for the most part, like, home studio, like, music producers out there, like, you're in, you've got your laptop, you're sitting kind of in your studio or in your bedroom, whatever, and that's how you're working, but... Like for me with the phone, like with the mobile app, like being like that project that I worked on was a combination of being out in the world, capturing sounds, sitting on the couch on my phone or sitting in my studio on my laptop. And, and usually you don't have the freedom to be working on the same project in those three instances. Like there's no like connection between those three things, or you have to transfer from this device to that device. So like, that is just like a, that's like a game changing workflow for me, for sure. Sweet. Ellie Winter has another uh, question here. Uh, I have a trouble imagining that the answer to this could possibly be yes, but maybe you'll know, John. He says, is there a way to make BandLab on the iPhone record from the iPhone mic, even if you have earbuds plugged in that have their own mic? So he's asking, can you be listening through earbuds, but use the actual built-in microphone on the iPhone? Yeah, so this is a very common request actually because mm -hmm. earbud microphones are awful. Um, yeah. And the best setup for latency and like good recording on BandLab is absolutely to sing into, um, you know, the f mic on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, there are some hardware limitations, I guess operating system limitations, yes, both on Android and iOS. Yeah. Um, so we have only certain access to what 
devices the operating system tells us about and we just have the options that they give us so in the settings menu on ios we have an input device and channel selection and if you see it there it will work um, it's basically what um, ios is telling us you can switch to and on android unfortunately there's no way um, to change um, the setup of which mic or earbud you're using um, just based on the android operating system Mm -hmm. I had a feeling that that was going to be the case. I couldn't imagine it being anything, but I wonder if there was enough demand for this. If you go from 37 million view, uh, users to 74 million viewers, uh, users, maybe some will invent some hardware device where you plug in your headphone and then you're bypassing the iOS. Exactly. But that, uh, at that point, just like get regular headphones, I guess, that don't have a mic built in. And then... Or, you know, Bandlamp can make it, right? That's maybe that's what we need. <laughs> hey, yeah, totally. The mini interface. I wonder what else it would do if you guys want to throw out ideas for the Bandlab made mini interface that would be a compliment to your phone. Let us know. Ideas, drop them in. Um, all right. Uh, a couple more questions here. Uh, Charles Rashabad says, I am... Uh, is, he says, I need a deep, to do a deep dive more in the product. I've used it, but I need to use it even more. So you're getting people excited here. Um, then we've got something from Anthony Smith. Here's another tough question about the technical minutia. Anthony asks, are there any plans to somehow integrate ASIO or another way to reduce monitoring latency while recording? Yes, this is a very good question and common um, because latency um, recording audio through the browser is um, not great. Uh, and I think uh, we watch Tetra's workflow and a lot of the recording of audio within BandLab is happening on the phone um, for a number of reasons. One of that being that, you know, we have more, much lower latency, right? Than on web, if you're singing um, with a set of effects. Um, and it really is platform dependent. So on Chrome OS, like we could see very high latency on Windows, uh, depending on the setup, um, different latency. Um, so the answer to the question is that, again, we're sandboxed because we make software um, within the Chrome browser or the mm -hmm. browser ecosystem. Um, but we've taken a really active stance. So we're working with the Google web audio team on uh, the APIs that browsers interface with um, the op operating system essentially and providing them data on like latency and ways to improve it. Um, so basically we can't fix it ourselves, but um, we're trying to be very active in like, yes, the development of these open source browsers, we can contribute to like, Latency is a big issue for us. You know, it's not a small amount of people who are making music on the browser anymore. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, Soundtrap has a browser doll, right? There's many people moving in this direction. Um, so unfortunately I can't, you know, there's no magic fix. Um, it's gonna take some time, but computers are getting faster and faster and browsers are getting more and more powerful. So, um, you know, I have my fingers crossed. Right. No, it's cool. I mean, it's you guys have limitations from working within the paradigm you've set up for yourself, but those limitations that you've set up are part of the reason the thing is so successful, that you've chosen this set of limitations. Uh, and then people, uh, they start to use this thing because it's so easy and so accessible, and then they get good at it. And then they start getting ideas. <laughs> yes. So you have a whole... Uh, I want to talk go. I want to talk more about that because... I grew up at this weird time in like audio and music production when uh, so like I graduated high school in like 2010. So like budding, like like music technology and like home recording has come a long way since 2010. So if you can mm -hmm. imagine, I was getting into it around like 2005, 2006, like exploring DAWs, exploring hardware. Like I remember like having a probably a Windows 2000 or something PC and trying to get things to run on that and trying to figure out like latency, like experimenting with recording and audacity. And I just remember like how much of a wild west it kind of was back then for whole home recording. Like the hardware wasn't there yet. The computers couldn't do what you want. And then we just saw this steep acceleration people in home studios, like really doing the work on forums. Like how do we get this to work? How do we get that to work? Um, and now it's all just like mainstream, right? So we've come so far in the home recording space. And that is really what this reminds me of because it's exactly what you said. It's like, because it's free and accessible, which is what I was dying for when I was a kid, somebody getting into music production, the thing that is free and accessible is going to give people the tools to sort of dream and, and start early. And once they get in early and more features get added and the technology improves, which it only ever does over time, 
it's it's so exciting because you're going to have this whole young generation of producers that are making music in a web browser, which I couldn't have imagined 10 years ago or something like who knows what they're going to come up with. And just the access, like people who wouldn't have had access before now have now can open up a Chromebook that they maybe get from school and like make something. So like, it's just like a mind blowing yeah. thing happening here that we're going to see the results of maybe like the real results, like 10 years from now or something. That's just really exciting for me. Yeah. Oh man. I, those are like the best. Uh, I just love to hear that. Um, Cause it's, it's just exactly like kind of our vision and the way we work is that, you know, five years ago when we launched, like you couldn't run real time audio processing effects on web, but we still made a web browser, right? Like um, three years ago, you couldn't change effects, right? And I guess our idea is it's better to, you know, push things out early, empower as many people as problem, even within those limitations, because it's better people are making music and just trusting that we can hopefully move as fast as our community is growing to like, Right. And technology is improving to like, you know, work together to like kind of make that work. Um, and I think it is like, yeah, the old PC 90s thing, you struggle with it. Then all the audio software was just like designed to look like analog Hardware. software. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So it's like, not only am I learning this new tool and I'm learning how to use a computer and it doesn't work really well, but I have to learn analog you know, style of mixing too. Let's bring all the inconveniences, all the inconveniences of analog hardware into the digital space. That's what we wanted. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, We needed it for the transition, but I think BandLab is like, um, I hope like that next generation, right? So instead of like your laptop and it's on garage, many of one mic and you're in a band, you place around the room. It's like, you can all just open up your project. Everybody has a phone and you just like record together, you know, with the mics and make your first demo, you know? Yeah. I think it's a great way that you guys are doing things. I mean, it's a modern way to release products is to get out something that works and then iterate and iterate and grow along with your community. And it's, you know, funny if you're sitting there as a maker of these tools and you've made something beautiful that works and you've spent countless man hours and then someone says, but can it do this? A, on the one hand, it's kind of annoying, but B, on the other hand, that's what drives all this stuff forward. And that's why we don't have computers that are, you know, just lagging along and we don't only have analog GUIs. So the the demands from the end users really help, uh, is what, what helps drive things forward. So a yeah. couple of uh, things here, uh, a couple more questions I want to get to for you guys. Um, first of all, compliment circle of tone says band lab is doing a way spell that way better job at keeping cakewalk stable than Gibson. So that's a compliment for you there. I take and, no credit for that. We have a great team working on cakewalk. All they need to do is be empowered. Uh, they do great there work. You go. Well, so. you're doing a way better job of empowering them then. So, um, Anthony Smith says, thank you for answering my question. Uh, poor monitoring latency makes recording guitars or bass through the band lab guitar. It's pretty rough, but I imagine he's talking just about the, um, browser based functionality. So the best way, if you want to record as low latency as possible with band lab, the idea I imagine would be to have some small interface for your phone, like maybe one of those IK multimedia iRigs rigs or something, and then recording through there would be, that be your lowest latency option to have like a mini interface for your phone or what are the best ways to record with the least latency as possible through band? Yeah. The, like an iRig type of thing is great on the phone. Um, I, I don't have issues with guitar and bass unless I'm monitoring through presets, um, Mm -hmm. on web. So I'll often record dry if I need monitoring or, you know, my focus, right. my, I have a Scarlet focus, right. A lot of interfaces have this, but you can input monitor, Mm -hmm. um, and, um, or loop back and a lot of, you know, maybe that wouldn't work, but yeah, hearing yourself on the input in some way, um, will solve that problem on any, you know, device. Uh, right. I think he's looking for the solution of being able to monitor the effects while playing so he can yeah. tailor his playing to the effects. And for that, maybe the best idea is, hey, this can complement with something like right now I'm talking into an Axino microphone from Antelope Audio that has his own DSP and you're doing real-time effects. So mm-hmm. you could potentially partner, uh, I imagine, that's a, a another development that might come more and more that will have really inexpensive um, down market, really accessible interfaces that have DSP processing. Um, I hope have so. the universal yeah. audio arrow, which has made that cheaper than ever before. Some of the um, antelope stuff, I think is even maybe less expensive, like their go series. 
And um, I wonder if IK Multimedia or some company like that, I'll start doing that at the hundred dollar price point. So you have your free yeah. DAW and your little dongle with DSP in it. So maybe that's in the future. It's well. great. Yeah. For the lowest latency effects experience, iOS and mobile, you're going to get near instant effects response and you can really jam out um, yeah. with whatever you need there. Cool stuff. All right, uh, let's keep on going in here with some of these questions. Uh, Ellie Winter says, great uh, job, guys. This is an amazing tool. He asks, are there any differences between how different browsers work with BandLab? I can answer that uh, very quickly. Um, so we are supported on Safari, Firefox, Edge, um, and Chrome. Mm -hmm. And there are some very minor differences um, in support of features within the mix editor, specifically for Safari. Um, so web standards get defined for how we get to do things with the code. And Safari and Apple often move slower, uh, sometimes much, much slower at implementing them. So for example, sampler will not work in Safari, whereas other recording functionality and effects will work, um, I believe, at this point. Um, but they're releasing the audio work that so it should be fully um, compatible uh, within the year. Otherwise, there shouldn't be any difference in Firefox, Edge, or Chrome. Um, all three of those should be um, fully supported. Cool. Picard says, thanks for Cakewalk is my favorite DAW. So very cool to keep that uh, alive as well. And this is a question I, I hinted at in the beginning. And I'm sorry to ask so many John-focused questions after Tatra just gave us such an That's awesome fine. presentation. But here's another one that I think uh, is probably more of a John question. It is, there were when I was looking up BandLab, I'm trying to learn more about one of the questions people had is, how does BandLab make money? And some people say, why do you care? It's free. It works great. You can use it. Why are you even asking? Don't rock the boat. And other people respond, well, it's because if I'm going to invest time in learning a new DAW, I want to be sure that it's going to be there in five years. I don't want to spend all this time figuring out this ecosystem. And it's so awesome that it's free, but can I trust that it's going to be around? So that's one of their questions. And they see what's happened to things like Cakewalk, where things have been up in the air, and they've seen things that, that happened to things like uh, Sonar, and what was uh, was it Traction, the one that was with Mackie for a while, where sometimes these things feel like they end up not having a home. So how is this sustainable? You can offer all the stuff that other people are charging for for free. So how do you do it, number one? And number two, how are you going to be able to keep on doing it? So I think those are questions that people are uh, eager yeah. to answer. I hope I am qualified to answer those questions, but I can tackle <laughs> some of that. I like, you know, there's a few concerns about free products. And actually it's one of our biggest problems is because free also connotates a lack of quality. Mm -hmm. um, and um, even though we offer a lot of things of like really comparable value, you would pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for, right? So there's mm -hmm. that. There's also like, if it's free, am I the product? And, mm -hmm. you know, at the state of social media, BandLab also working in the social sphere, like it's really important, like what's going to happen, especially with your creative work, your music, your samples, something you put time into, like mm -hmm. any question of money or ownership there is an issue. And yeah, if you store all of your stuff, um, you make all of your music, what happens if band life goes away? Like SoundCloud dying. Um, mm -hmm. For a lot of creators, it's like, well, I don't know where that audio file is anymore. Like that's the whole reason that I am even using SoundCloud still is like an archive of your work. So this happened to MySpace. Uh, like they just had, they lost like everything between a certain, like almost like a decade, like they lost all the sound files. It's just gone. Yeah. That's history. And so <laughs> it's yeah. And there's, you know, uh, there's things I've recorded that I've lost in MySpace. I will never see again, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but the, you know, I guess the answer to the question first off is I'm doing, you know, personally, like, I'm very invested in BandLab's long-term strategy, wanting it to be your um, long-term. And as fundamentally as a business, like to the audio and the music production space, is so ingrained, there's so many, like very few key players. It's like kind of really ripe for um, disruption, but we need to think long-term. So our business plan really is like in this more than 10 year plan, um, right? And thinking about how we can, you know, grow the community to build the tools, right? And then work to sustain that community. Um, and that leads me into like, you know, where's the money um, essentially, which is like a, a good question. And that BandLab as an application is a part of a larger um, portfolio of companies under BandLab Technologies. Um, so we work with music tech, uh, magazine guitar.com, um, Harmony Guitars, um, Heritage Guitars, Cakewalk, right? We have a lot of, um, 
other companies in our portfolio that do sell physical products um, mm -hmm. as well as uh, retail um, within Southeast Asia. And that's kind of where it's like, oh, it's easier to sell guitars if you have a bunch of free effects, right? But then you realize you build this collaborative tool that works anywhere and it kind of like is starting to change, you know, how people are making music and that's, you know, our direction. So for us, you know, this looking at the monetization strategies like within different large music technical companies, right? You look at Splice, right? It's monthly, you get a certain number of tokens, you pay for samples. It's the same, it's just, you're just paying for samples. You know what I mean? Like you get the subscription, the artists all get paid the same, right? You look at um, streaming services, artists really don't get paid a lot. So for us, it's about moving into building the infrastructure and the architecture to, you know, have artists like say Tetro um, self-monetize, right? what they're working on and, you know, more of this, uh, you know, band camp style of um, like working in um, inter, you know, creator commerce, right? So essentially like building a platform where people are making music and then a platform also where people can make money doing what they love. And if we build a platform with enough people doing that, right? The amount of money flowing through that system is enough to keep BandLab sustainable. Um, so. But things always change, and um, that's still a somewhat, you know, top-down view of it. But and I want to throw in a big uh, dream uh, for me, like of a, a, a potential. Like take this idea or throw it in the trash if you don't want it. The the reason, like, I'm able to do what I do, uh, be a content creator, you know, do music like as a digital creator online. You have things like the YouTube Partner Program, where they put ads on your videos, you get a check every month great. That's helpful to sustain. But now I, I try to think about that in music, like as a platform, SoundCloud is one thing because you just upload your music to it. But what happens when you have a platform that you can't, it's not just uploading your music to it, but it's also the creation tool. So what could potentially happen when you have, think of all these rappers that have broke on SoundCloud, right? Um, you know, take somebody like a, a little Uzi Vert or something like that, who ends up becoming a tastemaker. Um, everybody wants to sound like that. Everybody wants that artist sounds. So what ends up happening is they go to a sample library uh, source that sort of, you know, replicates that sound. But what happens if that artist comes up on a platform like BandLab, where they're not only able to release their music, release music on BandLab for people to hear it, but what if they are able to sell a drum kit? uh via band lab and that and then it's like literally integrated in the platform so they sell their drum kit you open it up in your project so now all these kids who want to be like this big um you know rapper of the moment can literally help generate revenue for that artist in ways other than paying for music which nobody does anyway now um and then band lab can get you know it's cut of that whether it's 70 30 like a lot of these services do or what but like through empowering creators i think that that is a model that is uh, being explored a lot by the social media companies, but I haven't really seen it played out in music specifically. So mm -hmm. I think that that could for sure uh, be a future for a platform like BandLab. Uh, yes, you might be speaking about the future. And we have, you know, the um, tip jar, we have ways to support artists within BandLab on the social side. And we also have an album release service where you can self-monetize an album and you get 100% of the cut. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're just, you're just paying for the fees of for us to basically charge that. And I think that's moving in the direction of like what Tate was saying that um, supporting, you know, breaking down bar barriers to making music, but also like sustaining um, the creation of music is really important for us. And um, yeah, there's not a lot of services working in that space because like the, maybe the samples and the music and the album is not the product anymore, you know, but you want to engage as a human with these people that you follow. Um, and that's why so many artists have discord channels where they're sending right. samples or running competitions and, you know, it's all DIY right now. And um, having some way for artists, you know, both to learn from the people they love and interact with them, use their sounds and then, you know, for some people build their career eventually and like, you know, have Banla be a part of aggregating their, you know, income source for um, working in the music industry is like, I think, you know, it's very ripe for disruption. So Tetra is kind of speaking the story in our praises uh, really well. Yeah. 
I think it's a great point. You t- you touch on something I've been thinking about for a long time, Tetro, which is that you know if you, you take this into the past and think, you know, imagine someone in the 19th century who was like a concert pianist, and then all of a sudden pianos become affordable for people to have in their houses. Should they complain and be like, oh, everyone wants to be a pianist now? You know, not as many people are coming to my concerts because they're home home playing piano and it's like man that's like the greatest opportunity in history and you do find producers engineers sometimes artists complaining that you know oh everyone's a producer now no one's paying for music but it's also the greatest opportunity in history just like all those people who had home pianos all of a sudden um, had greater demands for sheet music and music instruction than ever before it's a similar thing now in music where it's um, almost a collaboration of back and forth between the prominent creators and the people who are now not just you know, idle, passive consumers of music, but participants in music, which is a beautiful thing. I mean, everyone has music baked into their DNA, I mean, to varying degrees, right? But we all have that ability to be into music uh, baked into our DNA. And if you look at us going back into history, music has always been a tribal kind of group thing, everyone participating in it. And things like BandLab and the models that you're talking about, Tetro, um, really speak to that. And I think that that's uh, a great way forward. And you see it in so many other areas. I have a, a hobby called jujitsu and pretty much no one pays to go watch jujitsu matches. The only people in the stands are other people who also do jujitsu, but there's still this thriving economy around people who want to learn how to do it better and people who want to do it just like that person who is really pushing the envelope. And, and uh, it's great to see you really embrace that part of the space, Tetra, with your own channel. You guys should check out Tetra if you haven't already. He's got uh, you know over 100,000 subscribers on his channel and a lot of great videos that are really sharing his approach, what he's learned, and passing it along so people can make even faster leaps in their journey. Uh, so I really like how you've embraced that in a lot of ways. Thanks. Yeah, everything I do is open source. I talk about that all the time. Like, uh, I'm not hiding anything. I have no secrets. I think, and this comes up all the time because I'll do call-in shows with people from the community. Some people are happy with music as a hobby. Other people do want to turn it into a career, but then fall back on this old school mentality of the music industry. Uh, You know, make a record, sell a lot of records, make a lot of money. And unfortunately, that is not the music industry we live in for the most part, unless you get a major label deal or something like that. And I think everybody, first of all, deserves access to be able to express themselves creatively through whatever outlet, music in particular is my chosen outlet. Everybody should have the tools to do that. Everybody should have access to do that. And what it used to be in the past was only people who could afford studio time or only people who could afford studio equipment um, could go to the studio. And now you, everybody has a phone or everybody has some type of digital device. Um, they're just so readily available that they can open up a literal, a literal browser DAW and like start making music. So like, it just like flattens the playing field. And you might say, oh, well, everybody's a producer and everybody can make music. But at that point, that's why building a community is so important. And that's what I pride myself on. I don't care if, you know, I'm running the jujitsu tournament and everybody in the stands is just other people who want to learn about jujitsu and they're they're not what they're not there to enjoy the art of jujitsu. No, like it doesn't matter. Like I'm not one to judge like why people are sitting in the stands, why people are sitting in the audience. The fact is, is that they're coming and I could stomp my feet and say, like, you all don't appreciate the art. You're just here to get something. Um, But you know, I'm here, I'm playing, we're playing the game that we're put in. It's no use like arguing with the rules of the game. Like we just exist in this industry. It is how it is. Ultimately, what greater way is there to appreciate the art than to want to do it too? I mean, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yes. Collaboration is kind of at the heart of it. Like this community part of it. Right. And and same thing in band. I was like, regardless of like, if you're pro or amateur, what you're doing, um, like you're saying, like, I make more music when I'm making music with people um, Mm. or in community and I enjoy it more. And so that's, Mm. you know, one of the essential things um, we're trying to do. Um, Yes. Isn't it amazing that you can literally make music, build a community around it. And whether that's a community of five or 10 or a hundred or a thousand people show up and will like tell you what they think of it, or they'll take a minute to enjoy it. And like, think about like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the only peop- way somebody was going to hear your music was if you had a deal and it ended up on the radio or you played in some bar or like whatever. And like here, like my community is people from around the world, like Malaysia, India, Australia, like people in the States, Canada, like it's 
people I would never have reached a couple of decades ago. Like it, yeah. to me, it's, you can look at it two ways. It's a really hard time to be a musician because everybody has access and can make music, or it's the most beautiful time because everybody has access and everybody can make music and you can reach a wide audience. Yeah. One of the things we say internally in band lab is like, what's most of the world's first instrument? It's their phone. Most mm -hmm. of the world's first camera, you know, people born in 2020, it's going to be their phone. Their first, you know, it, it's going to be their first for a lot of things. And it, as it, their first sound banker, it might be the first thing they make music on. And, and that, amazingly, it's as, tr as in, it's as true in sub-Saharan Africa as it is in, you know, Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, it's way more empowering because it's, you know, we can, it's, their, you know, phones are widely adaptable to anything. So we can build them yeah. really cheap, you know, and buying a Moog is not accessible to a lot of the world. Um, right. That's just a fact. Sure. Yeah. We had a gentleman right in uh, named Henry in the chat here uh, from Zimbabwe who said, hey, Henry here from Zimbabwe, I make all my music on my phone. It's the most and, beautiful thing uh, in the world. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and it's so cool. It's the same exact experience that someone his age might have, you know, in the middle of New York City. So it's, uh, it's very cool to see us connecting that way. So last question, this I think will be the last question. You guys have been so generous with your time. Really appreciate it. Since we're on this tip of collaboration, um, can you give me an idea? What's a one or two features that you think make BandLab an exceptional tool for collaboration? And we'll leave it there. Uh, for me, it's 100% the sampler. It's brand new. It is a game changer because of that workflow that I demonstrated in the video and just because I just love collecting my own sounds and this so facilitates that process. And I, I mentioned this in the video, I think, but I didn't really demonstrate it. Say I go out and make a drum kit. Um, you know, maybe I'm at the beach one day and we're going to make like a beach, uh, sampler kit. It's got wave sounds, rocks, you know, um, seagulls, whatever it may be. I make that kit. It's not just in that project. It's part of my library. So mm -hmm. talking about like developing you as an artist, your own unique sounds, you start building your kits on the sampler and like suddenly you have this library of you. You're not thumbing through like, sure, use presets, use built in sounds. That's great. But like the more you you interject into your music, the more unique, the more ear catching, the more people start to recognize, oh, that's, you know, that's Tatro or that's that artist. I hear I hear the distinction. So for me, that's like number one feature right now. Cool. Yeah, I would I will throw in my favorite collaboration feature too, because there's a little hidden gem that we're um, sort of expanding out, um, which is on the web mix editor, in the top right corner. Um, this is where I should have shared my screen, but we, we don't, have, it's very quick. We have, you can start a real-time collaboration session. Mm. So if you press the plus person add collaborator button, you get a link and you can send it to somebody. And if they open it, they'll see their mouse. You'll see their mouse in the mix editor and you'll see them moving regions. And when they record a track, it'll pop up and you can edit it and move the effects. So not only is it, yeah, I can share a project, we can make different versions of it together, right? I can work on samples, but, you know, we're exploring the like, hey, I had an idea, what do you think? Here's a link, throw some bass on it. And um, so using these collaborative tools to work synchronously in addition to asynchronously. And that's a little bit of a Easter egg feature. And it's incredibly satisfying to just like have that in a DAW, you know, this like Google Doc experience, which is, um, yeah, it blows my mind. I love it. Worth checking yeah, out. Cool. All right, guys. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys for hanging out with us as well. Um, if you want, you can check out BandLab over at BandLab.com. You can also enter to win thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of free gear in the MixCon Mega Giveaway. Uh, you can check that out over at SonicScoop.com slash MixCon Giveaway. That's SonicScoop.com slash MixCon Giveaway, where you got three chances to win. It looks like Tatro's typing, so I'm going to guess yeah. that he's signing up for the MixCon Mega Giveaway right now himself. Um, <laughs> also, uh, Tatro, let's uh, hand it off to you to say hey where can people find out more from you where are the best places to follow you is it youtube is it instagram where are you what are your handles totally well i was saying some, hi to some people in chat i want to thank everybody who did come <laughs> over from uh, my channels and stuff my youtube channel is youtube.com slash tatro that's my artist name t-a-e-t-r-o you can find me on instagram at the same uh, handle tatro on twitter at nick tatro um come hang out on my channel i am live streaming multiple times a week i'll be live streaming tomorrow we're always making music checking out cool plugins um um, making cool stuff. So come hang out. It's a really good time. It's a really fun community over there. All right. Good stuff. Uh, any uh, socials where BandLab is the most active, John? 
Uh, you can find us on all of them. But if you want to get really involved with the team, check out our Discord channel. Um, you know, we show off experimental features, ask you questions about things that you want. And uh, it's a great place to give feedback um, for that. I think, you know, there might be some pro users here. And uh, yeah, we're even looking at expanding more of an alpha testing program. So I would say there, but also Instagram uh, and great place to follow us on all of our updates as well. Good stuff, man. Well, great chat. I really appreciate there's more people on the chat now than when we started the chat. So we must have been doing something right. You guys must have been giving some great answers. So appreciate your time. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tatro. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank you, Tatro. Have a good one. All right. We are clear of the live stream. Uh, cool. Tatro, thanks again.